Hey everyone out there, how's it going? Welcome to ScreenSpeak. It's the podcast that's all about movies, life, and so much more. I'm Jordan Anderson, this is my podcast, and as always, thank you, thank you so much for coming by and checking out today's episode. If you haven't done one of these things already, well, it's plug time, so I'm going to be plugging away right now. Please go ahead and follow the podcast and hit the bell on whatever it is that you're listening to this on, whether it is Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Deezer, Stitcher. Uh, there's a lot of different podcast services that are out there, but any one of them to hit the follow button and the bell on is perfectly fine because it all goes towards supporting the growth of ScreenSpeak. So please go ahead and do that. It would be super, super helpful. And I'm not just saying that because this is all data tracked, right? Not like you personally, like I'm not, I don't know what you're doing, but I can tell that you're listening to the podcast and it helps to promote the growth of it. So please, please do that. Uh, If you like social media, most of us do out there, or at least do a little bit of it. I actually recently just uh, added timers on my social media because I did I didn't realize how much time I was spending on it, and my my phone told me recently it was like, hey, uh, you're spending like I don't know like an hour a day or something like that, and I'm like an hour a day times like however you know many days there are in the year and years, uh, you know you add a, add it up, have an existential crisis, and then you're like, okay, I think I got to put a timer on. So that's what I did, but that's not what I want you. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and check out the podcast on its social media platforms. Uh, Facebook and Instagram is where it's at for the moment. Eventually, and maybe due to popular demand, I will expand to other territories being Twitter uh, or maybe even TikTok. Um, I, I don't know. Do you want the podcast to be anywhere else? I don't know. I'm not a mind reader. You can always let me know at the podcast email, which is in the description of this episode. But in any case, follow the podcast, follow the social media, and that will all be very much appreciated, uh, appreciated. Uh, And and yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have for the plugs. Uh, on to the actual episode. Very special episode for you all today. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm sure I say that before, uh, but this one is a special one and one that I'm actually very excited to talk about and promote uh, because I am joined on this episode by independent film festival directors Eric Fries and Scott Chrisman of the Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival. The Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival, for those that may not be familiar with it, and I admit myself, I heard about it, heard rumblings of it, um, but I've never actually been to it. So I definitely got a lot more insight by talking to the directors of the festival uh, in an effort not only to just promote their festival, but also to learn about how the festival works and so on and so forth. Uh, But I learned quite a bit about the festival, so I'll give you the key highlights right now before we get into the episode. So first things first, the festival itself will be running from April 14th to April 16th of 2023. Uh, All the festival information, including its website, uh, its prices, how you can volunteer, how you can donate, you can check out all the social media for the festival, all of that is in the description of this episode. Uh, But what I will tell you just from a high level is that this year they have 51 films that they're going to be screening. And I don't panic right away. They're they're not all full length feature films. There's plenty of short films, even a few music videos that are chucked in there. Uh, so plenty of different content from a variety of different filmmakers. Uh, so truly something for everybody. Uh, and all of them have an Iowa based connection in the films. Whether it's someone in the production that was you know from Iowa, or they uh, had their schooling done here, uh, something like that. Uh, but there's a lot of different uh, different flavor at the festival this year, I'm being told. Take a look at the website. Take a look at everything on there. Uh, I can also tell you just from a price perspective, it's very affordable and very doable. Uh, the adult full event, so basically just a full festival pass, it's $35 pre-show and then $45 after April 13th, 2023. Uh, And then students have a discount price for the full event being $25 pre-show and then $35 after uh, April 13th of 2023. But anyways, 
All that information is in the description of this episode, so definitely look at that uh, either while you're listening or afterwards and support these guys and support Iowa and the uh, independent film scene here. That would mean a lot, of course, to them, uh, but then also to myself. And if you're able to tell them that you heard about the festival through ScreenSpeak, that would be even better. Let me tell you about the conversation that I had with these guys. So Eric and Scott, they were very generous with their time. They let me ask pretty much anything that I wanted to talk about. And we talk about quite a bit of things. Uh, the episode itself, it runs for a little over two hours. Uh, so even if you can't listen to the whole thing in one sitting, that's okay. You can chunk this out, listen to it 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. You got plenty of time to listen to it before the festival happens. So definitely uh, don't be intimidated by the runtime of this. But I promise you it's well worth it. We talk about everything from just the background of Eric and Scott, like how they, you know, where they grew up, where they kind of uh, got their start with uh, film and, and kind of how they got uh, more involved with it over the years. Uh, we talk about, of course, the festival itself and kind of get a behind the scenes look, if you will. Uh, to a lot of the logistics and operations that come with uh, running and operating the festival that, you know, to the common person, they, they might not really be seeing all those challenges, but I think it's really interesting to hear them talk about it. Uh, we talk about some of the successes that have come from the festival and just some of the exciting things that take place at the festival and, and what really makes it stand out uh, apart from other independent film festivals. Really, really, I mean, it's just really cool stuff. Uh, we have some skittles and pretzels throughout the episode, so if you hear a little bit of you hear a little bit of crunching from time to time, that's just because uh, you know Scott and Eric they're enjoying the snacks as well as myself. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I'm just I'm really pleased with the episode. I, I really think you all are going to enjoy listening to it. Uh, and the main takeaway that I have from this introduction is this. Check out the Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival once again. All the information is in the description of this episode. Uh, and, and that's really all I got to say in this introduction. So, drum roll please. Without any further ado, this is my conversation with Eric Fries and Scott Chrisman, directors of the Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival. Let's do it. <music> Do you know what flavor they are? Nope. What's your guess? Gonna test your skills knowledge. They're too dark for tropical. I, I have think. Mm. I love how serious you're taking. <laughs> you're, you're really. I well, they're not classic because there's no yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have no idea. Say like, uh, <laughs> berries. Yeah, berries the, the wild berry. Wild berry. Okay. Yeah, okay. Skittles is not at all a sponsor of this, but you know they might hear this and be thrilled that I'm mentioning it. Sure, that. Skittles in a long time. <laughs> I say my eight-year-old could tell you what they were. He could probably pick out each flavor. Really? Yeah, he loves Skittles. Yeah, it's yeah. His favorite candy. No, Skittles are delicious. Have you guys had these? The the Snyder's cheese pretzels. No, I was kind of curious about that. Myself. Yeah, feel free. I I, I don't even. It, there might be there might be a little crunching in the audio. I don't even know. The listeners can take it. Um, so we had appreciate uh, employee appreciation uh, week this week at work. That's nice. So they brought everyone their favorite beverages and favorite snacks. I had asked for pretzels, so I got this big bag of uh, Dots Original. The Dots are they're very good, but they're they're a little addicting. Mm-hmm. Oh know? yeah. It's I, now. Do you do well with portion control? Nope. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. Because if the bag is in front of me, like it, it's gonna the whole thing's gonna go away. If it, I portion it out, it's safer. It's been sitting on my week or sitting on my desk this week, and just kind of like, all right, well, all right, I'm waiting for something to render. So, all right, let's open it. Let's some and uh, as, as Scott, what is your favorite snack? Oh boy! If it was Employee uh, Appreciation Week for you, well, I do enjoy the uh, the corn chips. Okay. Some good, good bag of Doritos, maybe or yeah. They're trying to be a little healthier though, so uh, apples has been okay. I got some behind some you. Spiral, yeah, you're, you're welcome to it. Uh, probably, oranges. I had, had my fill of apples. I think, but <laughs> okay. Spiral cut apples, um, and then uh, mixed nuts. Is yeah, good. that's good. My wife got me. I was just thinking about your portion control thing there. I, yeah, she got me a big jar for Valentine's <laughs> Day, and I noticed last night it's about halfway gone already. So. Mm -hmm. Doesn't take very much. 
Well, I appreciate both of you guys uh, for seriously coming on. Um, this really means a lot to me. I Hopefully, I think it'll mean a lot to uh, the people that follow the Cedar Rapids Film Festival. Uh, and, of course, just have a, a love for movies and especially to trying to support their local uh, entertainment enthusiasts and the people that actually actually practice it. Right? You bet. Um, so, I wanted to start off our conversation by talking about the background for you guys. You know, just give my listeners a little bit of context about who you are, what you do, and that whole thing. Sure. Scott, you want to... <laughs> who, who I am, what I do. Yeah, who wow, are you? That's pretty big. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, well, I've always, always had a love for movies, and I, I came of age at a time when suddenly that was in our grasp in a way that it hadn't been in a long... or ever... Um, you know, some people had the, the Super 8 and things like that. I was uh, little when VHS and camcorders were just kind of coming on to the consumer area here. And my cousins had some, and so we had fun at uh, family gatherings and things, making a little short film and doing something silly. And uh, So that was, that was fun. Uh, but I always loved movies. And then as I uh, grew up and went, went to college, uh, went into a communications program and ended up going through like a PR marketing degree, but always had that thought of, you know, I'd like to be involved with movies somehow and how could I do that? And so, yeah, just kind of led us this direction. Um, but yeah, no, I love watching movies and participating in creative things of all kinds. So uh, it's been it's been good. Awesome. Awesome. Eric, how about you? Who are you? Um, so, you know, I started out, <clears throat> when I was a little kid, we had a Super 8 camera. My parents bought the Sears, you know, the Sears Super 8 sound camera. And, you know, obviously we took it on vacation and stuff. But once I got a hold of it and I was making stop motion, Hot Wheels, Cars, movies, you know, where, it's, you know, they would explode and whatnot. And, you know, there were, there, I had no editing, uh, you know, no editing, uh, um, you know, equipment or anything like that. So it was all done in camera. But, you know, I, I also thought that was just the best thing to be able to make these stop motion films or, or, or with my friends, you know, make these little skits and whatnot. And that was, that was fun. And then as I got older, you know, kind of high school and college age, then, uh, you know, friends, actually one of Scott, Scott's cousins, uh, had a, a VHS cam, uh, camera and, and a few of us made, uh, I don't know, three, four, mil, th four, three or four feature near feature length films, I guess they weren't, they weren't, you know, Oscar quality or anything like that. But we had fun, and it was it was great. And so then I went to college uh, originally thinking I was going to be a theater major, and that uh, didn't end up doing that. Um, kind of turned to my second uh, love, which was which was art. So I got uh, I got a, a graphic design and photography degree at the University University of Iowa. Well, the last semester of college, I took an intro to broadcasting and film production course because. I remembered how much I enjoyed it growing up, and I thought, oh, I'm going to take this class. This could be really fun. Yeah. Turned out it was my favorite class. It was the best class I, I, I had taken. And, uh, you know, f for, for a moment, I was like, maybe I should stay in school and get a degree in, in film or, or uh, you know, communications. And the draw of graduating was too great. And I, I graduated, and I ended up spending over... Uh, 13 years working as a graphic designer and, and an art director, primarily to, at an ad, ad agency here in Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. um, a little ways through that part of my career, I sort of decided maybe I'd go back to go back to to school. And it was about 2002, 2003, I think. I went back to the university, got uh, uh, got into the uh, cinema and uh, comparative literature department, and uh, and ended up. Getting a second major essentially added to my to my bachelor's degree, so I did that and uh, stayed at the agency for a little while longer. Did some work there, then kind of did the freelance thing, you know, feature films, short films, you know, <clears throat> independent productions, commercial production, that kind of thing. And then uh, from there, then I uh, got uh, got hired on at uh, what was then Roush Productions, which was a video and event production mm -hmm. company, and. Um, eventually that became Wired Production Group, and I'm, I'm still there. I've been there for over 11 years. And I was going to say, so you, you covered quite a bit of years, I imagine, from just going through all that. Like, how long of a time span is that? Like, like the age that you kind of start to, to where you are now? I mean, this is probably most of your life, but... I mean, I graduated, I graduated from, uh, from college the first time in 93. So, you know, I did that, spent 
13 or so years mm-hmm. doing the doing the art director thing spent two years fr- as a as a freelancer um doing video and film production and then and then yeah it's been 11 years or so at the uh at the uh, production company what was it like going back to school i mean like just like you know was did you have like any you know apprehensions oh or, yeah 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 because i mean i you know i had a, a good job but i was i was feeling that desire to do something else to feel to to you know do that production thing again and you know non-traditional student you know i was the i was i think the only one uh at the time in at least at least at my stage in the in the production uh you know curriculum i guess um but it, it, it felt good i mean it was it was different because i had a little bit I had resources that maybe other students didn't necessarily have. I had access to computers and cameras that yeah. that uh, you know that I had. Um, but uh, I don't know it was fun, it, and it was and it was cool to just work with other, you know, production students. You know, and 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 uh, no, I, I I thought it was I thought I thought it was going to feel more strange than what it did. But once I got into it and realized I really have a passion for this, then it really didn't matter to me that I was that I was you know. 10 years older than, than everybody else. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, I think passion is incredibly, incredibly important with whatever it is that you choose to pursue with your life. And I, I don't know if I necessarily believe the whole, like, you know, if you don't know, do what you love and like, you're going to be happy because not everything that you love necessarily pays the, the bills necessarily. Um, you have to sort of find that line and, and find the niche within what you do love that is going to be profitable for you. Um, but you, you really can't do that without passion. I, I, I don't think so anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now I want to talk about the, the festival, right? So Cedar Rapids independent film festival. Uh, let's just go, go to the beginning. Uh, how did it all start? So at the beginning, <clears throat> I am in the, what, latter half of college and, um, hanging out with my drama club friends and doing small production things with that. Uh, at the same time, one of my cousins was working a uh, retail job at Radio Shack and managing that with some strange hours. And to, to keep himself occupied in his off hours, he was making a stop motion uh, thing with uh, Star Wars figures. And Th- That's he, not easy to do no, at all, No, it took right? him forever. <laughs> And so after he had completed it, he, he said, uh, or well, was still in, in progress. He said, hey, would, would you any, know anybody who'd like to voice this for me? Because really it's just me and I'm not going to get a whole lot of characters out of just one voice. Oh, yeah, I know some people for that. So we came over to his house and he set up a whole bike set up and we voiced over the thing for him. And that was kind of fun. And so then he got done with that and he said, well, this is, this is great, but... Um, Show it to my family, show it to my friends, and then it's going on a shelf. That's you know, it was a fun project, but there's really no continuation for it. And I was in uh, some marketing communications programs then, thinking, well, wait a second, maybe we could do like an event or something around this idea because you're probably not the only one doing this. Mm-hmm. So we decided we would try and host a film festival at the college, and just uh, on a couple months preparation if that uh gathered up six short films and ended up getting 35 people to show up and we thought well okay there might be something to this and certainly something we'd like to continue to pursue so then the next year we thought okay we'll we'll do it again and we'll do it a little bit broader uh, and brought eric into it because he was at that time was was going back or thinking about going back for his cinema degree and uh my cousin knew him from childhood and said hey uh, he can really help us out with the graphic design portion of things because that's what he does for a living. Sure. Okay, that's great. So we got somebody to make the posters, make the shirts, <laughs> and uh, did a great did job. Make that, with did that. he make that jersey? Uh, well, uh, no, nope. <laughs> not this one. This was later on. But so for the people that can't, the, the people that cannot see him. I mean, I actually, I, I just realized I didn't even actually. No, I didn't even hit record oh. on it. <laughs> it's, it's too late. It's too late. I'm not going. I'm not going back. <laughs> Uh, but he is wearing a jersey that has the Cedar Rapids Independent Film Festival. I assume this is, is this the early iteration of the logo? Uh, well, One of the current. Probably 2010 and on. I like it, though. But, it's but cool. Eric has designed some amazing things over the course oh, of like 20 years here. That's a nice compliment. Sounds like you're amazing. Several different logos <laughs> and, and, what, three, four different, I mean, 
multiple T-shirts, probably 15, 20 years worth of T-shirts. Oh, yeah. And then the, uh, the bowling shirt. The bowling shirt. That was fun. <laughs> I may have to pick your brain a little bit about merch because eventually I'm going to get some merch for this podcast. Oh, there you I've go. been doing some research into it. I'm a bit early into kind of what exactly I want to go down for that and how I want to approach it. But after this, I might have to pick yeah. your brain. Yeah, the bowling shirt. That was, a, that was an interesting <laughs> one. Bright blue and yellow bowling shirt. And there's one guy that, that volunteers for the festival. I mean, that was back in... 20 that was like 2007 Seven, i think yeah mm-hmm. and there's a guy that still wears it occasionally in fact i i had mine out the other day <laughs> for sure yeah it kind of reminds me of like people that, that follow a band and you know the album and artwork and everything changes and they they'll show up like wearing the old tour t-shirts you know to be mm-hmm. like i'm one of the first sure i'm one of the first fans <laughs> <laughs> well, we had you know t- everybody's got t-shirts and you sell t-shirts for the event yeah but uh after six years of that we thought, well, what else? What else could we do? Mm-hmm. And Eric's a very creative guy. He thought, oh, well, we'll do bowling shirts. We did polos. <laughs> uh, sometime later, it's like, you know, I'd really like a jersey. And I was looking. I, I wanted a baseball. Oh, I got a, a college baseball jersey. It's like we could have a film festival jersey. So I went and had one made. And there's a, there's a few floating around. But yeah, we got we got logos on several things. Hats. No, I like that though. But like, I I just. I think it, it catches my eye because, you know, when you think film, you don't exactly combine that necessarily with the world of sports. So jerseys and film don't necessarily oh, go so hand in hand in my head. Over, but it's the like the ultimate <clears throat> team sport for creativity. You've got like every that. department trying to do their thing and without any of them, everything goes away. I mean, it's a, an, it, it's obviously an extremely collaborative area in space, um, not dissimilar to sports at all. So I actually, I haven't really thought about that until just just oh, yeah, right now. Everybody's, everybody's got their role to play, and and as always, there's there's stars. I mean, you think about the directors or the actors who are the ones out yeah. front, like they would for a star player. But if you don't have your your key grip, if you don't have your gaffer. Your editor, your sound guy, everything falls apart. So you got to have your role players. Everybody's a strong piece of the team. You know, I thought of you guys uh, when we first met, which was a couple weeks ago, at this coffee house in Hiawatha. You guys remember the name of the coffee shop? Stillwater. Stillwater. Yeah. Still, Stillwater. Go check it out in Hiawatha. Uh, but when you guys were telling me about like people that had come from the festival and whatnot, and you mentioned, I think it was uh, Scott. Scott Beck and Brian Woods. Yeah, Scott yep. Beck and Brian Woods, and I thought of you guys because they're going to be at the Iowa film scene, mm-hmm. or the sorry film scene in Iowa City, of doing a Q and A of their movie, and I got and I got like one of the last tickets, <laughs> so uh, super excited for that. But I like literally their names connected because you guys mentioned that, so I just. Real quick, there. So, there are any more tickets mentioned. available for that? Rats. Uh, there, there might be like a couple, uh, but I know they weren't great seats. Like, I snagged a decent seat. I don't think it's great, but I'm, I'm super pumped for it. So, yeah. Oh, they're cool. Well, I probably won't make it to it. So, say hi, say hi from us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> definitely, definitely will do. Um, but uh, yeah, take me back to the start again. So, you, you guys met. You guys start working on it together. Um, mm-hmm. When did it kick off officially? Well, uh, two, 2001 was the first, the original, you know, six film, 35 people. And, and which college was this at? I don't know uh, if I believe Hosted at Mount Mercy. Mount, Mount Mercy. Mercy for uh, 01 and 02. And then, uh, oh, yeah, that actually, I got to do the first logo. And is that, is that the first logo? That is the first, first logo, logo yeah. yes. Okay. Sorry, wow. folks that are listening at home, it's <laughs> it's a beautiful tripod with a, like a, sort of a camera thing on, on top. Sure, yeah. Basically, Criff mounted on sticks and my rudimentary design skills, which is why we needed Eric Bradley. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was the, the first and second year. And uh, then the third year was at Co. And we just got bigger and bigger. I don't remember exactly what the entry numbers were, but um, it went up quite a bit from from the six. Mm-hmm. I think we maybe had, th- oh, 30 something, maybe the second year. I was, I was say, I've got it here somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere like that. But, but then it, it's, you know, gone up uh, we've had 70 80 pretty regularly this year we had 99 uh, for so films that for were films some, entered yeah there. wow mm-hmm. so yeah it's been good and then the real uh watershed moment i think for the festival was in two late 2003 so we hosted the one at co college and in that late fall late fall late summer i got a call from my mom who said hey I noticed in the paper there's a guy opening the old Collins Road Theaters, which had been dormant for 
10 years, maybe? maybe? Five, six, something like that. Yeah, and it was previously the, the Collins Road 5, right? Collins Road Correct. 5, yeah. yeah. When the, <clears throat> owning the Carmike uh, arena of things. And she said, yeah, this guy, uh, Bruce Taylor, he was in the uh, in the Gazette with this article if he's op- reopening the theater as independent theater. I thought that's something you should know, and maybe that would be somebody you should talk to. So I got on the phone right away and said, hey, uh, Bruce, I'm... I'm Scott Christman. I we run this film festival, and I think we'd like to talk to you and see what you got in mind here. Because he'd mentioned something about maybe hosting a film festival within the theater and doing some independent things because it was going to be an independent theater. Yeah. And so, say, hey, can we have a meeting? And I went and talked to him, and he, I explained to him what we were doing, and he kind of sat back and smiled and said, "You know that that is almost exactly what I had in mind." So. If you're already up and running, then why don't you come here, and we'll just we'll just host it here. So since 2004, Collins Road Theaters has been the home of the film festival. That's great, I, I, and I, obviously just from you explaining that, it's like it was meant to be, kind of thing. You oh, know, very like much he, so. he he thought it was at the right time. You thought it was at the right time. Um, what has that partnership been like just over the years? Oh, it's great. He's uh, what was the slogan? I think the slogan still is uh, for people who really love movies, and he you can tell. You know, from from walking in the door, yeah, he runs the theater very differently. It is definitely set up to enjoy the experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, the staff is very attentive, and everything is clean and nice, and nothing like the multiplex you would <laughs> you've come to kind of expect in sure. in some other places. And <clears throat> done a lot with uh, programming, some interesting things. Uh, he's got you know the standard fare stuff, um, but also independent things he's actually hosted a few of our uh, festival entrants with their premieres Mm -hmm. and uh, special event things like that so he's had a lot of flexibility to program some really cool stuff and also uh, stock the best popcorn there is yeah premium popcorn real butter butter. (laughs) i was just about to say that um he does have great concessions i mean his concessions are amazing yeah and they're fantastic and I, I, he doesn't. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that there are the least expensive concessions of the movie theaters. That's mm-hmm. true, and they're so much better. Sometimes I have yep. stopped to just get the bag of popcorn <laughs> to take to an event or to my home mm-hmm. because it's delicious. No, I mean I was gonna say if ever there's a plug for Collins Road theaters, it's it's right there. I mean, popcorn's the best. You can't find any better. Yep. Um, and, and then I guess like how has the the audience grown? over the years i mean like you know eventually like you you start in 2004 and it kind of keeps going but i mean like how has attendance been good i think it varies from year to year based on you know if there's any big movies that come in or movies that have a lot of local uh influence or local um participation Mm -hmm. that always helps i think the biggest thing is how much farther flung they have come from Mm -hmm. we've had entrants that originated in ireland really Um, both coasts, often uh, Georgia, Texas, all sorts of places. We got a film from Spain via Sioux City this year. So, yeah, and it's cool, when, and especially when those people make the trek to, to Cedar Rapids to attend the festival. So, well, so how do you guys, I mean, I want to still keep, like, in the beginning and the, the start of things. So, like, when, when the festival starts, how do you get the word out to people that are making films locally to, to submit to you guys? I mean, how do you start getting that word out? You're talking from, like, in the early days or yeah, currently? The, no, the early days. Yep. The early days was a lot of posters. Lots of posters. Posters yeah. and building an email list of trying to figure out who was around. Um, we were actually a little surprised to learn that there were a couple of festivals in existence already. Now, at the beginning, there was probably only one or there was, two. There was like when we were, yeah, when we like in those early two thousands, there was the Heartacre and I, I, IMPA awards. The probably. IMPA awards have all have been around since the nineties, but but yeah, I mean, then a little bit while a little while later, the Wild Rose came along. I don't remember when Landlocked. Landlocked was. Mid two thousand, mid two thousand, yeah. So there really hadn't been that many, mm-hmm. but because of the way we're really kind of involved with the technology, because in the late what till the late nineties or so, yeah, you could do a, a VHS camcorder like we did for you mm-hmm. know, youth things, but to do a professional production cost thousands of dollars and required some pretty heavy equipment. Yeah, as those costs came down with the Oh, what invention of the high high eight sure. first, 
And then uh, Mini DV certainly was huge. And uh, just as the consumer technology grew in capability and came down in expense, suddenly you were getting professional grade things that didn't cost that much. You could start to make a movie equipment wise for four or five thousand dollars, maybe. Not not amazing, probably, but you at least could get your hands on some tools. Mm -hmm. And then as the editing capability got better and computers got stronger, you were able to do make your own DVDs, make your own Blu rays yeah. later. So suddenly you had the tools of a full production studio in your house, in your business, mm -hmm. for not a whole lot of money. And then the invention, you want to speak to the, the DSLR craze? Well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, I think a lot of people, especially kids these days, kind of take for granted that they've got a movie studio in their pocket. <laughs> right. It's crazy. You today. know, back in back in the old days <laughs> you know you had to have a you had to have a, a decent camera a decent camcorder you had to have either a stack of vcrs so you could do your your tape your uh, your uh, editing back and forth you know linear style you know and yeah as, as you know as those cameras became more affordable and easier to use and and uh, the software was developed and then dslrs you know the dslr market just you know took off you know, with the early Canons, early Sonys, and and all of a sudden, here's here's like like a sub thousand dollar camera that oh. shoots really pretty dang good video. You, you if you've got a decent lens, suddenly you've got a camera that can shoot stuff that looks as good as the professional stuff from five years earlier. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. interchangeable lenses, where you're able oh, to yeah. start merging the worlds of photography with suddenly moving video and there were some hiccups there but just that you got the glass on it you could suddenly start making some cinematic looking things because you could control the depth of field mm -hmm. and you could adjust uh, frame rates and things that you weren't able to touch before after you're able to get uh, 24p in a consumer grade camera suddenly it was much harder to tell the difference as to what you mm -hmm. had done things with so it sounds like just technology, and of course, as a whole, it it's evolves. It's always changing, but it sounds like it. It's. I mean, certainly today is at a point where approaching film and, and getting into it is not. I would say as intimidating as I'm sure it probably was back in those back in those early well, days. Well, everybody's got a YouTube channel now. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah, er, Eric's absolutely right that you <clears throat> you take for granted now the studio you have in your pocket. Yeah. You have audio editing. You have video editing. You have with some things, you know, you're shooting 4K on your phone, yeah. and it may not be amazing, and the lens isn't amazing, but you can get it done. And to be a high school kid, to be a junior high kid, you don't need anything more than that. Mm -hmm. You can shoot it all there, edit it on your home computer, and suddenly you've got a movie. Yeah, uh, I think I was just say, yeah. I just I mean, we'll probably go into this, but yeah, you yeah. know, and it, <clears throat> the most important thing though is you've got these tools. Story. It always comes down to story and you know yeah. your content. Just what you want to say, right? I mean, like just like you said, the content. Sure. Well, it, it's adjusted because think about how many million dollar, multi tens of million dollar things we've seen that have been total and complete failures. Yeah. And they've had the tools, they've had the money and the resources. But it doesn't guarantee quality. No. You, you still got to have the story, and because it's brought these tools into a more uh, democratized idea. You've got stories that you wouldn't have seen. You couldn't have got sold for fifty million dollars, but you can do it for twenty bucks. Mm -hmm. How did the shaping of the festival like kind of happen organically? Because I imagine you know the first year that you do this, I mean you guys don't have experience running the festival back then. Right? Oh, we don't have experience now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm just curious because you know like when you're first starting things, you're first doing the festival. I mean, what sort of lessons did you kind of learn along the way to running and managing the festival? Well, the the motto for at least mine for a long time has been start everything earlier because <laughs> you just don't know how long this stuff takes yeah. and each portion of time if you can invest just a little bit more in it things get better uh, I think one of the big involvements was that we started drawing additional people in uh, you know it starts out with a small group and I'm going here's what we're going to do as you start getting a little more uh, diverse opinions of how things should should operate. Mm -hmm. uh, you get some better thoughts as to how things could function. Um, one of the biggest changes probably over the years was 
uh, wrangling through what categories should be. Uh, the <laughs> really? first couple were just, hey, here's a pot of films, let's put on a show. <laughs> and after that, you go, okay, we're going to start uh, awarding things. We got a list of things we can award. Maybe some of these things shouldn't be competing against each other. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a way to divide that. And so we started making uh, both skill level categories and content mm-hmm. level categories. And that's still. Uh, it's stabilized yeah. somewhat in the last 15 years. It, it was really interesting because you know over the last uh, several months, I've kind of, in preparation to you know relaunch the website and stuff, mm-hmm. I was kind of going through a lot of the archives, pulling out old VHS tapes uh, uh, from the first from the first year, which is is craziness, but 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 they were there. But then I I jumped into looking at what uh, what won awards in 2002, and and we we had you know cinematography awards and screenplay awards and editing awards and acting awards and direction, and we had it's most like the, like the most Academy innovative <laughs> and all this stuff, and it's like wow, we just kind of. I don't remember what it was. Did we just watch a bunch of films and say, hey, this should have an award, so what can we award this? Well, you couldn't have, I mean, because they were all in the same pool, you didn't want to say, well, this one is better than that one necessarily because they were having, it was really hard to compare them, both in, you know, cost, length, anything. Yeah, and I think 2003, we kind of got the structure, the, the bones of the structure. I think it wasn't until 2000, I think 2004 might have been the first year for the actual Eddie name. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I think it's been pretty consistent since 2004. Yeah. Well, there's always, you know, uh, there, there's constant wrangling over how do you define some of these things. Mm-hmm. And as we started splitting them up for skill level, you go, okay, uh, so student and professional. And we'd often get a lot of things in between they go well i don't make any money doing this this isn't my (laughs) job i'm not a professional filmmaker but i'm also not in school anymore so uh, how do we categorize those and we ended up with a a hybrid uh, pro-am so a sort of professional amateur Mm -hmm. hobbyist sort of realm where you're not getting paid to do these things that's not what your living is Mm -hmm. but you've got some skill and you're more advanced than a student so that kind of stuff and then also even in the division categories Within student, a lot of uh, students aren't making a feature film. They don't have the resources or the time to do that. So how do you categorize those in terms of length? Well, now we've got uh, student student long and student short. So student uh, narrative short, student narrative long. Uh, so it might only be a half an hour, but you're still telling a story. Mm-hmm. And also within that documentary of how do you, you know, it's a feature length documentary, okay, should that be competing against a half-hour documentary? Well, it, it does in our festival, but maybe that's not necessarily the ultimate way to do that. So length, skill, um, there's been some discussion of budget. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, but, yeah, just trying to carve up how this works and how things get ranked against each other. And how, how to be fair, judge. both both from our you know perspective as well as, Looking at it from the filmmaker's perspective, what's going to be, you know, what what are they going to perceive as as a fair, you know, way of judging one film against the next? Mm-hmm. Now, did you guys take inspiration from other festivals, like when you were shaping this and crafting it, or did you just kind of like, you know, what we're going to do our own thing, we're going to figure this out as we go, and just kind of go from there? Or well, I mean, initially there weren't that many festivals that right. to, to to look at, and we didn't look. I mean, we didn't know about festivals because there was no internet, right? You know, you know t- today you can pull up, uh, you know, you can pull up, you know, Google and type in film festival, and you, you're met with thousands of them. And, mm-hmm. and back then it was like, well, we knew that we knew about the festival, the Hardacre Festival in Tipton. We kind of knew how they did things. We'd go into their festival, but when well, you mean, hear about Sundance and things, but they're they're far away. Yeah, they're, they're so far that, removed yeah. from this space. So you I, know. I don't remember looking up any of that mm-hmm. necessarily. I mean, maybe if we had a specific question, we'd look for terminology or something, but I don't remember no. really drawing on any of that for So you guys just pretty much just took the bull by the horns and you're like, we're going to do this. We, we love this and we want to give something back to this area. Right? Yeah, sure. Well, I was looking at what, what is being made and say what, you know, what's being made and, you know, how do we, how do we take those, take that, that content and break it down into into mm-hmm. manageable categories and and what makes sense. And what was also very uh, beneficial was we had a, a group of and still have a group of uh, volunteer judges 
who come from lots of different backgrounds and different areas of expertise. And I remember some of those first few, we had, you know, whoever we could recruit. Um, so I recruited my college drama teacher for the acting, and we found a, a guy, I don't remember how we ran into him. We found, found different people who knew about production and had some production experience. Uh, Shirley Long, who had a lot of in-depth script writing things, was a judge for us a few times uh, from the Des Moines area. And she atta- uh, hooked us up with several different people who had writing experience or uh, acting, directing, producing, all those things. So when you get in those rooms and hear that discussion going on about the various films, you go, okay, well, this is this is how this film happened, we think. You know, this is the story of the film that we've seen. We realized that the crew had X, Y, Z to deal with, or clearly they had this resource or didn't have this resource. And so you're trying to figure out how to judge the overall product, the overall finished film. Mm -hmm. And they all had a lot of insight into, well, here's how you sort of help rank those things. Because after you've spent some time in production, you understand a lot of the pitfalls and challenges. And there are many shots where you go, wow, I can't believe they pulled that off. That's amazing that that exists at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you kind of figure out how to how to judge some of those things and give, give some leeway where you need to, uh, but also be a little more stringent on the, well, that's, you know, you're a professional. You should know about this thing or that thing. And, yeah, there's going to be things that happen on set. Uh, but, yeah, we, we learned a lot from them, from a lot of different aspects of of production and other Yeah, Yeah, things. I would say the judges were really helpful initially, you know, on the, in those early years kind of – giving us a little bit more direction you know because at the time you know i hadn't really i had not finished school mm. um scott you hadn't gotten into in production yet no i'd done a, i mean a, the, the stuff that you was in a consulting firm towards the beginning of that but yeah I mean, the real heavy production stuff wasn't until a couple of years later i did almost a decade in broadcast tv so just being on sites, you learn so much more about how that stuff works mm-hmm. and get a much better insight. And, oh, well, I see what you did there. And I, I'm glad you, you covered that up, but I understand what happened in that <laughs> instance. You appreciate, I'm sure, so many more little things that people that are not you know in the thick of it are, are going to overlook and they just probably sure. won't even notice they're even happening, oh, yeah. uh, which is sometimes part of the beauty, I think, of film because sometimes the... There are things that happen, and you're just like, you have no idea how hard it was to pull that off. Sure. <laughs> it looks so seamless to to the audience, um, but that that's part of the magic oh, yeah. of movies. Now, there are also kind of along those same lines, so you, you do occasionally see films where there's a shot in there that, like, why is, why is that shot? That's, that's useless. Why did they put that shot in there? Or, or something like that. And... You know, especially if it's if it's a filmmaker that's you know maybe maybe not quite as experienced or or, or even even an experienced filmmaker. You know, and you talk to them. You know, I can recall. I don't remember who it was, but it was quite a few years ago in the judging process or in the judging uh, uh, conversation afterwards, talking about a shot. Well, it took us so much work to get this shot, and we had to do this to get and, and I had to do this, and we had to leave this shot in because it was because it was just so hard to hard to to execute. And and I can recall judges, you know, yeah, but nobody else sees that you had to yeah. spend that much mm-hmm. time on the shot, and it doesn't serve your story. And yeah, the the, the end the, product is ultimately what people you know see at the end, and, and that's what has to be that's what has to be judged. I imagine. So. Sure, and I forget who the famous person is with the quote but the the kill your darlings, kill your darlings. Of, yep. of don't worry about the you know your favorite shot if it doesn't serve the story it doesn't serve the movie you've got to cut it and that was what we heard over and over of things and and that was that's one of those trial by fire learn by doing things of yeah this you know crane shot took us forever this you know timing or whatever took us forever ultimately in the editing room if it doesn't work it's got to go away and that's really hard to learn yeah and i i feel like well, creative people in general are, are kind of like this is that, you know, obviously people are very precious about what they create and understandably so, you know, they, it, it's not just the technical expertise they have to put into it. You know, they're really putting their passion, their viewpoint, um, their time, so many things that go into it. But I, I know firsthand as a creative myself, it, it, it can be hard to let that perfectionist side of you go um, and sometimes be like, you know, I just I got to be honest with myself and be like, like just what you guys said, this is not going to serve 
the remainder of, of what I've worked on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, not an easy lesson learned, but I think it's one that you know people just learn as they go through the motions. Right. Sure. Well, and it's subjective too, because mm-hmm. your opinion of what works or what does not work isn't the same as the next guy, yeah. you know, or the or the or the or the judge or the movie going public. You know, it's, it's you know it's, it's a subjective yep. you know, mm-hmm. art, and I think like any art. Where our festival maybe has a little different flavor too. Because we didn't have any um, heavy production experience going into it, we're viewing it from an audience perspective of, did mm-hmm. I enjoy watching this? Uh, there's so many things we've, we've seen over the years that, uh, let's see, you can, forgive, you can forgive picture and sound issues as long as it's something you enjoy watching. And if you think through technology now, think about how many things you've landed on on YouTube that you go, well, I'm watching this. Production value, not real great, but I'm really enjoying where they're going and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And our festival came along at a time when that was just starting to be a thing. Uh, and, and even, what, five, six years before YouTube was even really going. So it was kind of that idea of, hey, I've made this thing, I'd like to show it to people. Mm-hmm. And now YouTube's got some of that, or a lot of that. But because we're watching the things going, okay, I really enjoyed this story. Yeah, there's this thing where the mic's in the shot for a little bit or the production isn't so great, but because it is a good story, we're interested to see it. And again, the, the things that cost a ton of money don't always succeed. Mm-hmm. So we're right <clears throat> in that line of, can you make this and make it an enjoyable experience and something you enjoy watching? You know, I think some of my favorite movies uh, just over the course of my life, I mean, I love the things that, you know, of course, are critically acclaimed and, you know, the big blockbuster movies. I'm not a snob. I like Star Wars and I like Schindler's List. I I like all kinds of different things. Two very different movies I just mentioned. (laughs) Um, But, you know, the movies that I I guess speak to me the most, uh, pun, pun intended for the title of this podcast, but... They are the ones that I just feel are are being very truthful with what they're telling, um, whether that's in the story or just the people that are around it that collaborate. It's like they really what's on the screen is the most truthful and and telling version of the story as possible. Um, so sometimes I, I love a movie just because it's really you know just entertaining. Like I just had like a a, a rush of you know. Um, trying to say like endorphins or something like that sure um but you have a rush of feelings and then there's others where it's like man like that messed with my head and i gotta think about this for a little bit or the rethink your life movies you know where it's like (laughs) damn this really is sitting with me in a in a profound way but i can't put a word on it uh you know other times you laugh and stuff but but my point with all those different feelings is sometimes it's not like you said it's not strictly on the technical aspect it's not even strictly on the money it's just about what is being presented on there and is this actually having an emotional reaction with myself. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, and I, I feel like I'm very in touch with that. I don't know if everybody else necessarily is. Um, you know, more film people are, you know, they know how it you know, really works on their on their levels, but other people they're just like, Oh, it's pretty good. And I'm like, mm-hmm. But I think you'll, you'll always catch people that way because I think you're right on it. Even your general audience who has no particular movie tech knowledge or anything like that knows what they enjoy watching and knows when something's made a connection with them. Yeah. I've always thought it's a great thing, especially through uh, this festival and other festivals, to go sit in a darkened theater and be exposed to something you'd never see before. You know, whether that's being in space, whether that's somebody else's uh, life experience in a documentary, you're suddenly in their, in their shoes, you're with them during their story. And if you can forget that you're watching a movie, then that's done a really good job. That's one of the best feelings I can say. And science fiction is a genre where that usually works for me, where like if you're really transported, mm-hmm. you almost have to do like a double take. You walk out of the theater like, oh my god, I'm, I'm on Earth now. Like, oh, holy sure. crap. Like, like it, it's, it, you can't put a price tag on that. It's the best. I remember leaving the theater having seen the first Matrix, and you're going, wow. wow. What do I what do I think is real? What do I think is real? <laughs> this is, this could be a simulation right now. Sure, if you think about it, like, I could be in a pile of goop. So, <laughs> so and, knowing, <laughs> and knowing those things, and even I would put it to the real life things too in documentaries to know that yeah. I've seen someone's story from halfway across the world, who I would never meet, who I would never interact with, just due to distance, 
and yet I've shared a human experience with them, having yeah. watched their story. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So not at all a smooth segue, but I want to talk about the festival today. Okay. Sure. So first off, like give me just an overview of it. Like I want to know when is it happening this year? Um, where's it going to be at? I think we already talked about that earlier, Collins Road Theaters. Um, but just walk me through the festival this year. Well, it is April 14th through the 16th uh, at the Collins Road Theaters. Yes, that is, that is correct. Um, it'll be happening... And I'm going to pull up my cheat sheet really quick because I can do that. Yep, you sure can. Um, in past years, I'll just, I'll just for those people that have, have been to it previously, we're, we're, uh, we've expanded our schedule a little bit this year just because we wanted to show more films and you know have more programming time. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually starting at, uh, I believe, about 1.20 on that Friday. We usually start at 6. But frankly, the 99 films that we received were great. We yeah. got so much good content. It was just phenomenal. That's great. And and it's tough to say, geez, we have to cut, you know, half these films. How many do you screen? We're screening fifty one. Okay, fifty one films. So yeah, that which is still just barely half. Yeah. And and how now when did they start submitting? Like when were the when were submissions open to be It was like the end of December. November was the beginning November, of December. December yeah. yeah. Okay. And how long does it take you guys? I mean, like do you watch the entirety of it and then like be like, "Oh, I got to decide like the what stays, do. what goes." The judges do. Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. Just watch for everything and and God bless them because they crammed that into like a month, month and a half and it was something like 40 Three hours of content it or something was, like that. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. We have, we we cut it down to twenty. Just it's a little bit over twenty four hours, if I remember correctly. Remembering correctly, yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so fifty one films. Yeah, yeah, and and like I said, the all ninety nine were were terrific, and we had and it was tough to for the judges to have to cut those down. But um, I w would all but guarantee that the fifty one that we were showing are the cream of the crop of this year's films. So I don't know if, I, I don't expect you to name all 50. Oh, good <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to play on the spot like that. Um, but is there any particular ones that you want to highlight or like bring people's attention to, or, you know, any filmmakers that are going to be there that have maybe been here in the past or are these all new people? Like it's a mixture. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's several filmmakers that we've had in past festivals. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the cool thing is, is, there are, there are filmmakers who submit a film every year, every other year, or whatever, and it's nice to see them come back and sure. and see what they're doing differently, or see you know see what they're see what they've been up to and talk to them. And then there are others that are, that have never heard of our festival and they saw it on on uh, Facebook or they saw it in Film Freeway and they say, oh, I never knew about your festival, but what, I'm submitting. What's, what's Film Freeway? Film Freeway is like the central place for film festival entering and management. Okay, um, it's a website where. Basically, I, I don't know what the what the number of film festivals that are that are listed on it right now is, but essentially, it's a site where you can, if you're a filmmaker, you've put your film in there and all your biographical information and everything uh, pertaining to your film, uh, and you're able to enter film festivals via that mm -hmm. website. And as a film festival, you're able to set up your festival in there, put all of your all of your rules, your uh, your entry categories, set up set up all the 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 uh, you know the way that the people can can select what category they're in, pay for their film uh, festival entry fees. I mean, it goes through judging. So, like all of our judges were able to watch the films on Film Freeway and do their judging right in the platform. It's That's nice. Yeah, it's come a long way because you talk about doing it twenty years ago. We were you know hooking up banks of VCRs and <laughs> making copies after copies and having to ship. Eric's them. just like shaking his head like, oh, oh it's ridiculous. No. And even when we got to DVD, that was that was great. It was a little bit easier, a little bit faster. Sure. Uh, but now it's just, yep, it was submitted. It's streaming on your site. Log in, go look, and judge it. Away we go. What are the rules for the festival? I mean, like, obviously, like, we have the 51 films, but, I mean, like, what are they, I guess, like, being judged on? Like, how, how does the, you know, what, what happens from there? They're judged within their category. So you enter a film, you, there's lots of attributes for you to fill out. Uh, and it's mostly due with skill level, length, and category. Mm -hmm. So we've got things like uh, narrative feature, so your traditional feature movie, uh, documentary, long, uh, short, and uh, freestyle, which is kind of a 
uh, video art, maybe music, music video, videos, for very experimental, that, yeah, kind of mm-hmm. experimental, mm-hmm. non-traditional sort of freeform things, or at least doesn't fit in one of the other categories. Music videos are wild. I just gotta tell you guys. I mean, like, we I, got a few. We do, do you really? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, are they like bands from like I'm assuming Iowa, um, but or, or uh, a elsewhere? little bit of everything? I think mm-hmm. we had yeah. uh, some different places. Sure. They just blow my mind because some of them, you know, like they're they're just so strange. And then I I just wonder like how do you explain that to someone and like make that into a feasible <laughs> thing? Like some of these strange concepts, but sure. I, I, oh, I yeah. won't go down that road. Um, so so talk again about the the categories, the judging process, and, and that whole thing. So we got. Uh, everything from student up through professional. So those are the main, the three main things, student, pro-am, and professional. Okay, so student, your, pro-am, professional. Student, you're in school, being a student. College, somewhere. high school, College, high school, elementary. We've had we've had elementary students submit You've had elementary people submit mm-hmm. homes. Mm-hmm. They often have some help yeah. from their parents, but they, their idea was there. I mean, still, but that's impressive Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the, the pro-am with the, again, the not making a living, sort of the hobbyist sort of enthusiast we kind of say 60 we i think the rule is 60 percent of your income or less does or less come from production sure so that way you don't have you know i'm a producer by day or something if you've got a day job that's paying the bills that applies to one of these categories you're a professional so you should be competing against professionals in that what's new at the festival this year if there's anything. Well, uh, besides the student, website, it sounds like there's a new website. We have a brand new, new website, website, crifm.org. Yeah. Um, Check just, out the description of the episode. It'll be there, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And absolutely. Uh, student Cinema Sunday, Eric's brainchild for this year, is, is Sunday with students. It was it was part of, part of the thing, again, going back to just trying to show more films, um, knowing that we've got a finite number of hours that we can program because of, of just the way mm-hmm. the world is. You've got a schedule that you have to stay under. <clears throat> And looking for ways to expand that schedule, looking for places we can show more film, time we can show more film. In, in past years, we've never gone on to a Sunday before. And I was just thinking, you know, let's, let's see about expanding our schedule to Sunday. And what can we do differently on Sunday? What can we do that's a, something fun for, for filmmakers? And, you know, we've always been, we've always been very high on, on student filmmakers because you're seeing these young people who are, developing as as artists as you know storytellers and and it's cool to just see them you know not to bring up scott beck and brian woods again but their first the first time they entered the festival was 2002 and they were what sophomores in high school or something freshman Freshman high school school. and i was like wow this 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 is not a bad film this is actually pretty good for kids and over the years we saw them continue to improve their craft and keep keep sending you know keep sending things into the festival and, you know here they here they are now you know big stars but yeah. but it's always cool to see those students and and help give them encouragement and a, and a forum to show their films you know obviously youtube has made it very very uh, you, know, you know easy for a student to show a film you know to the entire world but well, it gets out there but it's it's cold and yeah on uh uh not interactive yeah. to watch in a theater with a crowd is a whole different experience absolutely and i think that's one of the things filmmakers have told to us over and over of hey i loved watching my movie with an audience and this is one of the few places i would get to do that and they laughed at the right place they were scared at the right place i understood my beats that i put in the film were hitting they were doing what they were supposed to do mm-hmm. and with the students especially they bring such interesting new ideas sometimes mm-hmm. because they've they've grown up with all of these years of film that we've already seen and they have that as a background already so they're able to offer homage things or a whole different idea of oh I'm going to do this and it's a, a throwback to one of the early years but I remember one of the judges comments to one of the filmmakers at the time was one an inventive idea for you to put the camera behind the faucet most people would not have thought to put it behind the sink like that. Right. And you really evoked a, a both a feeling of depth visually and also served the story with what you were doing. That person is now a published author three times over and was actually a judge for us this year. Who, who is it? Uh, Jenny Dewis is her name, Jenny Stolte at that time. And uh, just learned, and she submitted with different groups for five, six years or so throughout mm-hmm. college and other times. 
that it was great to see her develop. And now she's got uh, these wonderful sci-fi books. Uh, and I think she learned a lot through the film process of building story mm-hmm. and building character. So lots of things like that where uh, people will bring you some innovative things mm-hmm. just due to the nature of them being students, them being young, yeah. to say, oh, I'm going to try this a little differently. In, it's one thing I find uh, consistently as as a creative myself, and I, I think you guys are creatives in your own rights, you know, different aspects of the film world, but you guys are both creative for, for doing this, you know. Um, but one thing I definitely find with creatives is that you, you need stimulation, right? Sure. And certainly I imagine in the film world, you know, people working on movies, they thrive off that energy. They thrive off people that are kind of getting behind a shared vision and people that are artists in their own right. And they have a story they want to tell and they have a different look and direction. And I just, I just think it's great that you guys are giving people from this area an opportunity to express that, not only express that part of themselves, but find that they're not alone and sure. putting them in in a network in the community where they can you know share that be appreciated for it and then they can get inspired and then they'll do things they never even thought of by oh, being yeah. a part of that. I mean, there have been filmmakers, you know, particularly students, who have come to the who have done their film with maybe a couple of friends or, or family members, brought it to the festival, and then they met other yeah. filmmakers their own age or or, or people that they, they didn't know, and and suddenly, hey. We've built a community of, of filmmakers. I've now I've got I, I now know this guy and this girl, and I can make a film with them, and and uh, and it's great. So helping those students just kind of find their find that that community and and develop mm-hmm. as as you know as artists is really kind of what Student Cinema Sunday is all about. And 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 I do want to put just a quick plug in. Oh please, that, please. that the uh, admission uh, admission uh, fee for students on Student Cinema Sunday is is quite uh, uh, reduced from regular. Well, what is regular admission? Let's talk price. Oh, boy. Uh, You've got a lot of different uh, options. Okay. Because it's broken up into sessions. Okay. So you can come for a three- or four-hour block uh, a couple different times. So if you're interested in coming for, like, a a Friday afternoon, Friday evening, Saturdays for, for smaller blocks, those are available at a certain price. Yeah, each each uh, for an adult uh, single session is is ten dollars in advance or twelve dollars uh, on the day of the show. Students students are eight dollars or eleven dollars uh, a day of show. Student Cinema Sunday for students is only five dollars, um, or uh, or day of show is eight dollars. And then of course uh, we encourage people to buy the full event passes because then you get in all all six sessions, mm-hmm. come and go as you please. Um, how much are the passes? Uh, the adult full event pass is thirty-five dollars in advance, or forty-five dollars day of show, mm-hmm. uh, and the students is uh, is twenty-five and thirty-five, and that's like you know, that's a fraction of what it would cost if you bought individual sessions. So, sure, I, I mean even listing off those prices, I mean it's certainly affordable. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, you think of what you shell out I'm, for just a two-hour feature anymore, and this is giving you three three and a half hours or more well and it's also more i would say immensely satisfying because it's obviously not your traditional studio films i mean you're getting to sit with in some in certain cases some of the people that made these oh absolutely um i'm sure you get to talk with them and whatnot um totally different experience Mm -hmm. and that's something new we're doing again doing uh, kind of in response to filmmaker demand uh you know earlier uh earlier in the the season we sent out a, a a survey to Past uh, past entrance, just kind of picking their brains, getting ideas from them as to what they liked, what they didn't like, what they'd like to see, um, and a lot of them came back with wanting to do Q and As. And I've been to festivals where Q and A is a is a is a regular thing. And I thought, okay, let's let's move this into let's move this into our festival. Again, trying to expand our schedule, making room for that sort of thing. So. We're now going to be doing uh, Q and A's with the with the filmmakers. So that's another thing I think people really enjoy is that ability to talk directly to the filmmakers. And you know, if they see something interesting on the screen and they wonder, you know, what was the what was the motivation or what was your inspiration for doing this film, you know, then you get, you get to have that conversation right there. That's amazing. I, I know I, I've partaken in a few Q and A's just as a fan myself, uh, not at a festival. I'll admit. Um, kind of crazy. You would think I've been to several. Uh, this will be the first festival cool. <laughs> uh, okay. that I've gone to, but I, I am massively looking forward to it. Um, but I agree as far as the Q&A process goes. Um, for the few times I have experienced it myself, I, I, it's a thrill. Um, sometimes it, it can be intimidating to be like, oh, I'm going to ask a question, especially if there's a you know a big crowd and, and whatnot. But 
Um, I just I think you have to remind yourself that you're in good company. You know, you're you're in a in a space where people want the excitement. Oh, yeah. They they're not going to you know care if you're gushing a little bit. You're like, oh my god, <laughs> like oh, you know, because we all do it. Sure. Well, I think the beauty of uh, the, to build on the networking portion that Eric was talking about, that you are you are in the theater with some of the people who've made these films. And if you're interested in filmmaking, this is a great place to come and learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, great place to network with people who are doing it. Uh, even if you have no experience, I would encourage you to introduce yourself to some of these folks and say, "Hey, I'm I'm interested in acting and directing and in production. How do I do this? What are some good resources to go look at?" Uh, I have seen a lot of what Eric is talking about in terms of. Uh, Cross pollination of people that show up. Hey, I got my film. Look, all these other people are like me. They want to do my thing too, and then they go off and build a much better film because they found five other people at the festival that would like to work with them on their project. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'd say if you got any interest at all uh, to come as an attendee and go, oh, well, okay, what films did I like, and can I find those folks and talk to them a little bit and offer to go and hold their boom mic or something for them in their production because then sure we you know every crew needs some extra hands so if you can get in with some of these folks go yeah i like making movies too how do i do this everyone needs help yeah yeah i mean the movie making i i've never been a part of a making a film but it is no one man show i mean that that, that's certainly not the case i mean you you need a army of people to to collaborate Mm -hmm. and to get behind it well, and certainly in a lot of independent films, you're not working with budgets where you can go out and hire the top name in, in whatever department. You can't hire the best sound mixer in the in the country. You can't hire the 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 most in demand director of photography. So you're you're working with. You mean Roger Deakins just isn't on standby? He's like, yeah. I, he I asked him if he <laughs> I gave him a call and he's not going to be able to make it to the festival this year, ah, unfortunately. Sure. So well, yeah, no. and students especially, they're drawing on their family, their friends, their classmates, mm-hmm. anybody they can get to show up on their Saturday, they're going to do it. So if you can have a, a audience-rich environment of people go, yeah, I'd like to spend all night doing that with you. That'd be great. <laughs> I would love to stand out in the cold. Well, well, speaking, the well speaking of the audience, like what is, what, you know, what's the typical audience that comes to this? Typical. I don't know if there's typical, I, I but you know, typical audience. I say, no. Well, I wasn't sure if like if you guys get into like your demographic it's, for like, we usually attract men or, or women or this age or anything like that. I mean, it's just a mix it, of it, everybody. Wide, wide variety. It's a mix, you know, kids all the way up to to yeah. you know senior. I mean, it it really some of it depends on the content of any particular block or any particular day. If there's something that's uh, you know that's uh, you know subject matter is of of a specific. You know, topic it mm-hmm. might attract people that are interested in that sort of, you know, thing. Sure. Um, yeah. But I would encourage you, you know, if you're a film enthusiast at all, movie person, just come and sit for a block because you're going to see some stuff that you've never seen before. You're going to see some interestingly produced things, mm-hmm. and because we have an Iowa connection, that's really the the basis of all of this because they've got to have some relation to Iowa in topic or people. Mm-hmm. You're going to learn some things about your state that you didn't realize uh, and, and pretty quickly. I think even for the uh, area we're in, uh, in Cedar Rapids, there's a lot of, of viewpoints and various things happening in our big metro areas here. But throughout the other corners of the state, we've got a lot of different folks with a lot of different experiences. and films about them are going to show you something that you probably never heard of or maybe never thought about and it gives you that chance to have that connection both to your community uh, to your state and also you know through various topics maybe something you're really interested in uh, we've got you know some things on on farming this year again big in-depth documentaries in iowa of all, of all places on, yes of all places <laughs> there's farming here what there's some farming <laughs> Actually, no, there are, we've we've we we seem to get a lot of really well put together rural themed documentaries, mm-hmm. yeah. and it's 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 cool. And you then, are, of course the student things, but also uh, was it a Russian Russian guitarist this year? Russian really? Yeah, um, a do- so, do- so do- documentary. Yep. Yeah. So some some great, just interesting sort of industry things of uh, music of uh, art over the years, all sorts of. Uh, different things and the thing is if you're into film just you know come and and 
don't necessarily look, oh, this is something I like, this is something I like. <clears throat> Go and sit in a theater for, for a couple films that you don't know anything about or that, that sound interesting, but maybe not what you'd typically watch. Because you never know if you see something is like, wow, that I was not expecting to enjoy that. Or I was not expecting that that was going to resonate with me. You know, it, it's it's cool because, you know, even as even as as you know, organizer of the festival, I mean, we watched a lot of the films and, and thinking, you oh, know, I'm not going to like this. And it's like, well, wow, that, I actually learned something that was pretty. That was pretty interesting. I've learned something every year. And yeah. at every single festival is that happens in this state. I had no idea that was even a thing, let alone that it was, you know, a couple counties away. I think that's one of my f- absolute favorite parts of, of films is, and, and I don't know if th- some of this is just because of how I am as a person. I mean, I, I'm a very open-minded person. I, I love to learn. I, I think learning is a journey. It never stops. It doesn't matter what age you are. And movies, I, it's almost hard to put into words the amount of values and lessons and just interesting thoughts and things that have come from movies that I I would never have gotten from any other medium out there. I just I just wouldn't have. Um, they, they really just speak to me in a big, big way. Uh, I got to take a pause here because uh, my recorder here is about to die and I need to All change right. out the batteries for this, but we'll, we're going to pick up here in a second. smells like when you don't have two boys <laughs> <laughs> okay so that, that, that's compliments to the missus i am a messy guy i probably don't do the greatest job of cleaning so thank you isola every every household's gotta have somebody that has an investment in that <laughs> yes uh, my, my wife i mean she she's even being a great sport she's she's tucked away in the back i'm sure if i yelled at her she would she would come out and not yell that sounds aggressive <laughs> call call to her <laughs> honey like she's doing one of, one of those um, so we're, uh, Jordan has provided us with some lovely uh, yeah. uh, IPA beer here, mm-hmm. and it, it led me to another thought within the film festival of, of things, again, that we discover as we get entries in. Uh, a couple years ago, probably three years ago now, four years ago, there was a documentary entered called Wine Diamonds. Oh, yeah. Wine and, Diamonds, what's that it about? It was a, a documentary about winemaking in the Midwest. So within Iowa, Illinois, and uh, various surrounding areas, Minnesota, I think, where there's a cold, cold-grown grapes in, in like winter areas. So you think of winemaking California, more temperate yeah, climate, Martha's Vineyard or something like sure. that, right? Mm-hmm. These are, are cold weather grapes that grow in a completely different environment and produce different wine. So the whole documentary was various wineries throughout the region here that that work with these grapes. And so we were fortunate enough to get a few of the wineries to come in and have uh, served some samples at the time. So, again, another one of those documentaries you go, I, I realized, yeah, I mean, I heard there was wineries around and stuff, but I didn't realize it was a whole other division of grapes. It's a whole other execution of wine as an idea. Mm-hmm. So th- things <clears throat> we learn every year. That's crazy. How are the pretzels? These are great pretzels. Yeah, I was going to say, they're great. I will say the, the buffalo flavor, good. The jalapeno flavor also good, but uh, not to be overly descript, but you might have some restroom Ooh. difficulties. Okay, yeah, no. Might be some follow-up. Ch- cheddar ones are safe. Cheddar, cheddar's good. I mean, you can tell me. like You, you can't go me. wrong with cheddar. <laughs> no, no, you absolutely cannot. Um, so, I'm trying to think, where were we at before we had to take the pause? Because we, we were talking about the networking opportunities, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Just to come and watch a block of films because it's going to be yeah. I want to I want to talk about that. The block of films now. How long is a block of films? Oh, you know, anywhere from three to five hours. Okay. I mean, it, it depends. Um, and how are the Q and A structured this year? I know you said you're going to do them. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do it by block, and this is something I picked up from my my friends up at the Iowa Independent Film Festival in Mason City. Mm-hmm. Is they did they were they did a block of films. And then a Q and A. They bring up all the filmmakers from that particular block. You know, if it was a group of shorts or if it was a couple of features, they'd bring everyone up from that that had films in that block and have a conversation that way. And I thought it worked really nicely. So that if you're, you know, if there was one one, if you showed a film and there was like a filmmaker, you know, you're not one person just sitting up there kind of on the spot. Mm-hmm. That there's ability for as filmmakers to have a conversation amongst yourselves. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna take uh, take the, the blocks. 
Um, and they're you know probably an hour and a half sure. in length. And then once that block is done, we'll bring those filmmakers up. We'll have a conversation for a little bit with them. Um, for features, we're going to do, I think we're going to do features with a Q&A following. You know, the, the thought is to just kind of break them up every every hour and a half or so just mm -hmm. you know both for conversation purposes you know that we'll put a break in there also um just to l let people get up stretch their legs and and uh, and whatnot that's that's uh, that's amazing amazing i'm i'm just very very excited <laughs> I, I you know we've never done q a really uh you know anything formal so I, i'm looking forward to it not so much in a structured way we have had some you know panels and things but sure because we we're trying to squeeze so many films in to the content you go, well we only have x amount of minutes here how much can we <laughs> well i'm definitely going to get to some more logistical stuff a little bit later on uh but i want to talk about the awards so what are the awards like you know what what do people get if they win uh, yeah tell me about that it's the eddie awards mm -hmm. what awards. is an, what is an eddie an eddy is a current in a body of water, usually a river, that flows against the predominant current. So we thought that was a good thing for both the independent film, being that it's you know kind of an alternate current idea, mm -hmm. uh, and going against against the mainstream, or at least separately from the mainstream. That's, that that's, was that's clever. Somebody's vocabulary word from yeah. like 15, yep. 15 years ago yep. or more. Now, is it, is it a trophy? Is it a plaque? I mean, like, what, what do they get? This Trophies? year it's going to be a trophy. Okay. Um, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. We've had numerous types of trophies over the, over the years. Um, I don't remember what, what we had initially. Um, at one point we had a, a film can. Film cans, yeah. Film can with, a, with a, a film strip kind of coming up out of it. It's hard to describe. Yeah, kind of yeah. this, this metal sure. film yeah. film strip it's coming good. up out of it and kind of hovering over it, like sprouting kind of from the film. Sort game. of sprouting. Mm -hmm. We had a, a number of years where we did a, a reel with a with a, a plate in the center of it. Mm -hmm. um, had a plaque for a number of years. Some plaques, a few times. Yeah, we we liked doing the the full on like thirty five millimeter film reels, but they stopped selling them. Supplier was out one year. We just suddenly couldn't get anymore. But we've had and we've worked with local artists to put things together. Mm -hmm. um, some local local folks who assembled things or created things for us. So we actually have that again this year of um, someone that's going to custom design yeah. some things. Ben for Ben Fiddler us. from Fiddlesticks. Uh, he does a lot of uh, a laser engraving of signs and other 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 things. But mm -hmm. uh, um, I've known him for a number of years. He uh, actually worked in the production industry. A uh, number of years ago, also, um, mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, we're doing an acrylic plate. Um, we've got our CRIF logo back this year with the uh, projector kind of made out of the uh, CRIFF letters, and, mm -hmm. and we're going to do an acrylic uh, acrylic uh, etched plate uh, with that. So, kind of looking forward to to doing something with that and see, seeing what people think of that. That's that's pretty cool. It's also interesting, like just hearing the evolution of like just how you actually like produce the award and like what it actually looks like over the years and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, now, aside from the the trophy, I mean, like, is is there anything else that comes with it? Is it just like you know the bragging rights for it and you know just being like I got this Eddie in this category? Bragging rights right now. Uh, there have been other things attached over the years, but yeah. the the main selling point I think is is recognition that your film was uh, successful. Sure. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Part of the survey was, what do you want for awards? Trophy, cash, prizes, mm -hmm. and the majority came back with with trophy. I was I was actually kind of wondering, are people going to say I want money? Right. A lot of people just want something to put on the mantle. Sure. It's, I mean, well, it's a it's a point of pride. Yeah. We've seen them, yeah. you know, with all our various Zoom calls and things over the last couple of years. You end up seeing the trophies in a lot of interesting places that people have them on their shelf somewhere, and and uh, I've actually seen a few that were years and years old. Mm -hmm. So some of the reels and some of the cans, I think, from yeah. a couple of the early years. You go, hey, that that I see that on your shelf back there. I recognize that. That's that's from quite some time ago. But yeah, it's, it's a point of pride of hey, I made this thing creatively, you know. and I was I was recognized for it. Yeah, I think I think awards. You know, it's it's a really interesting thing because some you know some people you know get you know a little too into the of you know the award itself and like sure. they, they they like almost like worship the damn thing um, <laughs> you know and, and then you know in some cases too you know then you have the ones that are just like ah, i don't i don't need the award you just like pitch it and whatnot but i for, i'm of the belief that it is a it's a validation of your efforts by your peers it's it's proof 
essentially that what I am pouring my blood, sweat, and tears into is actually being seen by people as being worthy of acclaim. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, you know, some, as they say, you know, some of the old ways are the best ways, and I, I don't think you can go wrong with giving somebody a trophy. I mean, it feels good to well, get a physical object to, to hold and touch like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We always make it a point, too, to talk about the entrance. Again, we had 99 films, 51 are in. That means there are 40 how many that aren't aren't in and so uh, even just to be on the screen yeah is quite an achievement against uh the other entrants and your peers because i imagine for some of the people uh entering into this you i'm sure have first time entrants right Mm -hmm. oh sure Uh, and it's probably the first time they've ever seen anything they've made blown up on on the silver screen sure Sure. right i mean you get so much more out of it i mean anyone can watch something on their phone at this point but it's a totally different experience to have a you know 40 60 foot screen premium sound uh it's always interesting to hear some of those first timers talk about oh wow that you know i could hear my mom in the kitchen or the red <laughs> various other sound things you go oh yeah I'm, I'm hearing a lot of the imperfections and stuff that yeah, because it's like, notice, well, cause it's like how you would you how would you even go about testing that because you know a lot of these people they're not gonna have access to a theater to be able to project some of this stuff out so yeah that's a that's oh, yeah. a very good point 